thank everybody for coming tonight. My name is Dave Nichols. I'm the executive director down here. A couple of quick things I'd like to say for those of you that are members. Thank you for your membership. It gives us a chance to find great <coughs> presenters like our one today. If you're not a member with us, I encourage you to please sign up. Consider joining. Um, we do a monthly speaker series as well as all the other programs in the Mexican group throughout the year. So we encourage you to do that. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our presenter today, Chris. Thank, thank you so very much for coming tonight. I really appreciate this. And I appreciate the invitation from the director, um, Nichols. And uh, this evening we're going to be talking about um, after the war, the first few post-war years in the mo after the most significant historical event in, in Minnesota, which was the 1862 war, Dakota War. And it was an, a, a breaking between the old, where the Dakota and the Ojibwe and the other uh, Indian nations were uh, the dominant force in culture, in uh, politics, in controlling of the land, and the new way that would start. And now, one of the difficult things about looking at this time is that this is a hard subject. This is a difficult subject to look at when you look at post-war. And this is true of any post-war. I don't know if just a couple of weeks ago on 60 Minutes, you might have seen uh, a displaced persons camp in Syria, you know, after the, the huge earthquake that they had. They said there were 53,000 people living in a displaced persons camp. and they're still being shot at by the Syrian president. They're still under war. So for them, they're displaced, they're homeless, and they're still in a state of war. For the Dakota Indians, this was the post-war era. And so now we are 161 and three quarter years since that event. But there is still such an interest in, in this event, and also there's always so much to still learn. There we go. I always start my programs with a list of the people who have helped me, because no one does a program without lots of help, lots of networking, lots of um, knowledgeable people that you can call on for expertise. And so you can just look down the list, and there might be some names that are familiar to you um, also. And then at the bottom here, I have a collection of uh, historical societies. Nicollet County, uh, the southern Minnesota, is actually in Mankato State, uh, in their library. And then, of course, the Hennepin County Historical Society, you'll be seeing some of their pictures, which are monitored by the Minnesota Digital Library at the U of M. And then, of course, the Rock Island Museum down at Rock Island, Illinois, which was is across the river from the Davenport site where the prisoners were taken um, in May of 1863. And so this is the site of the Dakota uh, internment camp. And for some of you have, that have visited it, this area, or if you've gone to the airport, uh, this is just across the uh, Highway 5 from, um, from the, the airport there, the International Airport. And you go down a good two blocks or so before you get into the park. But if you have uh, uh, grandchildren that love to bike, or if you like to hike yourself and, and walk and not be troubled too much by cars and traffic, this is the state park for you. It is just wonderful. Miles and miles of uh, trails. Uh, you might run into a band or two of wild and very hungry turkeys, but um, <laughs> you can get away from them. But there are picnic areas. There is a uh, memorial to uh, the Dakota who were uh, interned uh, at that site. And there's a great uh, visitor center. But 
when I was a little girl, and so this is before the state park was established in 1962, we would be going to the airport to pick up two of my uh, mother's sisters, and my father would just sort of, um, with his hand, he would say, the camp was down there. You know, uh, we had family down in that camp, or there was a camp there. And, you know, I wasn't, you know, when you're, when you're very little, you, you aren't sure what it is, but it made an impression on me that there had been something important at this site. And this is a picture of my dad, 1945, in Germany. And he was an old man when he was in the service. Uh, he was born in 1911. So he always got to drive the, the half track. And the young guys that were 18, 19, and 20 years old, they got to walk along the side. But on April 29th, 1945, they left Munich. And there were lots of troops heading out that day. The group that he was with, they were headed west. And after they had gotten out two miles or so from Munich, um, he said, and he always described it the same way, he said, we hit a wall. We hit a wall. And it wasn't a wall that you could go around or go over or blow up. It was something that soldiers were very familiar with, and that was the stench of death. And he said, it was just. It was just horrifying. And they knew that something terrible was coming. And so another five, six miles, and they came into these areas. Now today, oftentimes the internment camp is called either a death camp or a concentration camp. And these are the camps that we know the very best. But there's one thing that the Nazis were very good at killing. And these are actually all of the camps, and especially the sub-camps, that were part of the Nazi death program. Uh, and the, what I found, when I found this map, what I found to be so interesting is that it says not all of the, all of the sub-camps are shown. There were more. And um, uh, in 2018, my family and I went um, to see what Dachau looked like. And you go into this one huge, long building, and on a wall that's probably uh, 35, 40 feet tall by 40 or 50 feet long, it has a map similar to this with every single one of those camps or those uh, concentration camps or death camps or sub-camps on them. And so here we have just the sub-camps for Dachau. And about right in the middle, you can see Munich. It's, it's right below Karlsfeld. Here we go. There's Munich. And so that morning, April 29, 1945, my dad's group went west, and they entered the subcamp Lonsberg, and then later, the next day or a couple of days later, they went northwest up to Dachau because um, the um, President Eisenhower, or General Eisenhower at the time, he had wanted them to see these camps because he had explained to them, this is what you are fighting for. So here is Landsberg, one of the uh, sub-camps. And this is what they came into. Oops. And this is a picture. And what I, what I think, when I, when I think about this gate and the gate that is going to be talked about in the internment camp, there's quite a distinct difference. This, these are Americans, uh, and they're guarding the gate to Dachau. And you know very well that when you have a concentration camp, death camp, very few people walked out that door. Uh, in Dachau, there were two crematoriums, and then there were many, many mass grave sites. So this door uh, gate is distinctively different from the camp, inter the internment camp. 
And so what I would call the internment camp, not a concentration camp, not a death camp, but a camp for displaced persons. And after World War II, from 1945 until uh, 1956, the Allies established uh, in Germany and in Austria and all the way down to Italy um, camps for displaced persons because uh, in 1947 alone, there were 850,000 people displaced. And they were political prison prisoners. Maybe they didn't have, they couldn't go back to their home country. Borders had changed. But just because I call it this, it's because I look at what I see at what a, a concentration camp is and what I see a displaced person camp is. And that is what I see as the true nature of the internment camp. But in my, my book on, on the internment camp, I have actually have a chapter in it that says, call it what you will. And I went through all of the historical data and literature to find out what, what were all of the names of the internment camp. Prison, camp, uh, uh, confined space, all of those in the same genre. Um, but if, if there are those, there are historians that do call it concentration camps, as I said, call it what you will, but when you, when you're a historian, you have to look at what is the true and accurate term. And for me, displaced persons camp or internment camp is the camp. And now, from 1945 until 1956, um, there are some photos here of people who were in displaced persons camps. We have some students. They had their picture taken. We know that uh, higher education wasn't an, uh, a goal for the Nazis, for the children that came into their camps. We have children playing here. Now, the buildings they lived in might have been awful, but they were safe. And they even had Quonset huts. And then finally, this picture, this reminded me of many of the pictures we've seen coming out of Ukraine when Ukraine first was invaded by uh, Russia just a year ago. And you see all these mothers with their babies and their little children and they're trying to march away to uh, safety. And these, this mother and these people were trying to find a place of safety. And now here, if you watch Channel 2 cooking shows, this lady, whoops, sorry, let me go back here. I appreciate your patience with me. There we go. This is probably, these two ladies are the, probably the most famous displaced persons in America right now. Now, the grandma, she died last year, but this is Lydia Bastianich, and she has cooking shows on Channel 2 all the time. So, and uh, she, she and her family worked very hard, but they have achieved the American dream. Now my family has been in Minnesota a long time. And I just met a, a, a gentleman in the back here and we we're probably cousins. Um, but I'm a direct, and, I, and also I am not a uh, tribal member, but I am a lineal descendant of Minnesota's Midewakanton people, Dakota people. I am a direct descendant of Wabasha one, Wabasha two, and you know, we had nothing to do with this. It's just uh, a matter of who married who. Um, and this would be Wabasha II here. Uh, my great-great-grandmother, uh, one of his wives, uh, was uh, Ho-Chunk, or uh, uh, Winnebago. And then Wabasha II had a number of sisters. Uh, Angelique Wabasha, who married Michel uh, Labeth, and their son, Francois, married my great-great-grandmother. So we have cousins married each other, marrying each other. Um, great Cod Woman, one. And then Catherine Wabasha, uh, and this is her here. Uh, she was one of the first Christian converts. And this is her son, Lorenzo Lawrence, who was a good friend of Little Crow. And here is Wabasha three, his son. Uh, and this is my family tree here. So with her first husband, she had two children, and with my great-great-grandfather, she had a few more. 
<laughs> and uh, um, only one did not survive childhood. So, so this is Wabasha uh, three, and Wabasha four, Napoleon, and more sisters. More of uh, these are uh, in Lucy and Jenny, and she married John Hoffman. They are both buried in uh, Hastings. And we also had two uh, family members who were executed at Mankato. They were um, uh, extended family. So they were actually Wabishaw's uh, brother-in-law, white dog, and one of Wabishaw's son-in-laws, a uh, rattling runner. And now for people that live here in, in uh, Faribault, these are people that you're probably quite familiar with. This is old Betsy. She was born in Mendota. And this is one of her children. This is Teope. And now Teope means wounded man. And I'll tell you how he got his name. They lived at Kaposia, which is with the, uh, the Kaposia, the, um, the name of the village means like traveling light. Um, and so this is where South St. Paul is today. But in 1842, Old Betsy and Teope and one of Old Betsy's sisters, and they canoed up from South St. Paul to uh, it's called the Lower Landing. So this is right on Shepherd Road. And so William Forbes uh, had a trading post here. And so this is it. Uh, of course, in the in the old days, in 1842, it was all grassy. It was a, a real river bank. So here you're looking north. This is Robert Street Bridge. So right here is where Father Galtier's chapel at St. Paul was, and right up here is where William Forbes' trading post was. If you look down the other direction, here is the Lafayette Bridge, and there is the White Rock, and then you continue going down the Mississippi. But in 1851. After the 1837 treaty, this was the land that was uh, sold, ceded, uh, in the two treaties, 1851 Treaty of Traverse de Sioux mm -hmm. and Treaty of Mendota. So there's actually two treaties here involved. And this was their land strip that they had. It was between 142 and 150 miles long by 20 miles wide. So 3,000 square miles. Yes? Which was the part that the band got to keep? Oh, the, the white strip here? I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't make that clear. I, I, that's where the, the Native Americans were saved? That's where, that, that, was their, that was their reservation. Okay. The rest of this is what was sold. Okay. In, in 1837, see this little tiny strip here? Mm -hmm. There was another small treaty. This one, uh, everything east of the Mississippi they sold. And so really only two bands had to move their villages across the river. So here we have things that are happening in 1851, and those are uh, the two treaties, Travis the Sioux and the Treaty of Mendota. We're going to jump another few years, it's 1861. This is a remembrance or celebration of the 10 year anniversary of the treaty signing. And that summer in June, there was a, well, they call it a grand pleasure excursion. Two river boats filled with tourists as far away as Davenport and Dubuque. Prairie du Chien, La Crosse, traveled up, met with people uh, in St. Paul at the Lower Landing, and they took a, a, an excursion up the Minnesota River to the Lower Agency or the Redwood Agency because that strip of land, 20 miles wide, um, two of the bands had the Lower or Redwood Agency, and two of the bands had the Upper or Yellow Medicine Agency. And the purpose of this was to show off the beautiful scenery, to show off all this land that had been bought, and to pay the annuities. So I have a question. So that 
that yeah. white strip you showed earlier, was that where the Minnesota River ran? Yes. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. So this boat went up there. It went up there. And it, it, uh, in, in the summertime, it was often very difficult because the, the water would drop, you know, during the hot summer. But it was uh, the, the gold annuity payment arrived. They had planned this uh, in advance, you know, so all these tourists could come along. But we had uh, a number of the um, state senators, representatives, um, reporters, uh, photographers, uh, and even the governor and his wife and daughter went on this trip to make this payment. And they had uh, uh, the Indians danced. Uh, they had uh, a, a, a beef dinner. Um, and so it was, it was quite uh, a, an adventure for all of these people. So here we are, and this is the, the date of those things there. But just the next year, on August 17th, uh, 1862, you know, that there was the incident at Acton. And so this is when, you know, the, the four or five young D Dakota men, they stopped at the home of uh, Robinson Jones. He was the postmaster, had a trading post there. Um, Robinson Jones left with his wife and uh, went over to his son-in-law's house, Howard Baker's. And the Indians said, well, Let's have a shooting contest. And I, I know this is the old story. Um, so the, uh, the three men that were there uh, fired at a target that was on this tree called Target Tree. And then they did not reload. And the Dakota, they had already decided um, that they were going to shoot uh, and, and kill these people. And so the men did not re reload their guns and the Indians simply turned their weapons on them and killed them. And then they walked into the house and they shot uh, Mrs. Uh, Baker, uh, or, or Mrs. Jones. And so at this site, we had the first five dead. So uh, the digital library I told you about, these are some very amazing photos that you can look online. There must be 250 of them. And they were taken by a high school Minneapolis High School uh, history teacher uh, between about 1885 until uh, about 1929. And every year, he and his wife, Maggie, traveled all around Minnesota going to uh, history places, Minnesota history places. He would take these glass lantern slides, these images, and then he would show them to his class. This picture because we know that they were there after the Acton um, Monument was installed in 1909. So this was in, this are the remains of the Howard Baker cabin. So sometime after 1910, probably, between 1910 and 1929. There is nothing here now anymore, um, but this is uh, the, the remnants of it. Where is Acton? Acton is... I'll, I'll have a map Here for you. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll show you. Okay. It's uh, by Candy, Ohio County. <clears throat> so up by Wilmer, in the say Wilmer area. But I'll have a map for you in just a moment. So here is Maggie in her long dress and her coat, and she's at the monument. And here is her husband, Arthur, at another site. So now the 1858 treaty, there was one more treaty. And this is where they were persuaded, uh, the Dakotas, to sell the, the northern strip of their property to the government. But part, there are two interesting articles in this treaty. The first one was, is that the Dakota were going to be friendly to all of the uh, settlers that they might meet, or they would lose their compensation. Because if there was any plundering, any destruction, they were going to have to pay for it. Then there was another section of this Article 6 that if there were people who had attacked settlers, that the other Dakota was supposed to turn them over to the government or they would lose all of their annuities. And this is in response to an attack that had been in 1857 down in Spirit Lake in northwestern Iowa and southwestern Minnesota. 
But we know what happened on the next day when all of those uh, four young men uh, hurried back to um, the, uh, their village. Um, this is the agency building, the warehouse building at the agency, the lower agency. Early in the morning, the Dakota had decided to attack, and what they were going to do is try to remove all of the settlers, all of the trace of the settlers, and remove them from all of Minnesota. They were going to push them all the way out of Minnesota. So we had started with five deaths, and now by the end of August 18th, we would have another about 266, 270 deaths. So here we have pretty much a description of the the control that the Dakota had over Minnesota. There, all of it, all of Minnesota. So here we have the Mississippi River, down here to St. Paul. The Dakota pretty much controlled from Henderson and everything north of the Minnesota River, South Bend, Fort Ridgely, up to Birch Coulee, and over here, here we go, here is Acton. So we have, it is uh, Forest City. So it would have been southwest, southwest of St. Cloud, probably by car a good hour, hour and a half. So, and, and of course, these places are so isolated. Um, there is no telegraph. There is no, uh, there, of course, there's no phones. <laughs> um, so there is no way for anyone to know what is happening out here in western Minnesota. And so here are the two agencies, the upper and then the uh, lower, the lower down here, right here. And so here we have Fort Abercrombie. That's about as far north as the Dakota would attack. And so Chief Little Crow was all, would end up all the way up there at the end of August, near the end of August. Um, but this is up by Fargo. So that shows you the extent of control. They controlled everywhere in Minnesota. And so we go down all the way here. And so right about here is Murray County. And right across from on the other side of Murray County, if you, if you cross into um, uh, South Dakota, then you're at Sioux Falls. So that is far west as, as we usually talk about in the Dakota War with the fighting. But you can imagine, this is about 30 counties that they had complete control over. So what did people do? If they could, they took shelter in towns. And so in New Ulm, and, and uh, uh, Director uh, Nichols is very familiar with New Ulm. This is a picture, 1903, uh, by Anton Gog. Um, and what the people in town there did is they barricaded, was three or four blocks off, and everyone inside was uh, safe. The outside uh, perimeter buildings um, were set on fire by townspeople, some were set on fire by Dakota. But every town, if, if it could, Wilmer, or Hutchinson, Forest City, Glencoe, uh, Mankato, St. Peter, um, they all had little stockades. And so it was the only way, if you couldn't leave, and Medelia too, um, if you couldn't leave, you had to protect yourself. And so this is, here we have Fort Ridgely, a fort with no walls, same as uh, Abercrombie. Abercrombie had no walls. Um, but here in Forest City, and I'll, we'll go back just a second. Here is Forest City. So it is close by Acton. What happened at Forest City, now this is a replica of their stockade. Uh, they rebuilt it as part of their, um, the bicentennial in, in 1976. But in, in uh, 1862, the townspeople had assembled and donated 280 logs. Is in, in like three days, 
they built a stockade. This ground here is very sandy, so I don't know the perimeters, but the, they had, uh, it was big enough that uh, the 280 um, logs formed a double thickness. And then uh, when Little Crow and his people, his soldiers, uh, rode their horses up and discovered that it wasn't an open city anymore, that it was a protected city, he decided he wasn't going to attack. Um, and this is the same thing that happened at Hutchinson, at all these towns. At Hutchinson, Forest City, um, Glencoe, um, anything inside the stockade was safe. The rest of the city burned. And so if you were inside a stockade, you were safe. Uh, if you were one of the casualties, you were uh, either by your wagon with your family all dead, or in this case, you escaped, you ran. And this is the, a picture of the only image that is, is believed to have been taken during the Dakota War. And right here, we have Reverend Riggs. He had lived with the Dakota since the 1830s, well, about 1835. This is his sister, or his wife, rather, uh, Mary. They were newlyweds when they came out. And this is one of their daughters. She was very beautiful. And so when Adrian Ebell, the photographer, um, was uh, setting up his photo, he knew exactly how to make a beautiful picture because she is right front and center. But her mother's watching her, so she's fine. And this is a picture from Nicola County Historical Society, 1903. And what we have here, it's, it's not the best picture, but you can sort of see there's a ridge here and then there's this line of trees and the defenders of St. Peter considered this a, uh, a little bit of a protection for them. And then the rest of this, what you're seeing is flat prairie looking toward uh, Closter. So what they did is this is where they were going to have, uh, they were going to protect themselves. They could lie down here with their rifles and when they would see the, if, if the Dakota would attack their city. They would be able to uh, protect the town. This is right up by the college, by Gustavus, or was up by, none of this remains anymore. And, and I said, um, everything in this uh, war, in this, uh, was controlled by the Dakota. Um, there were a few battles during the war. The uh, battle at Birch Coulee, uh, the U.S. troops were almost routed. The battle at Acton, again, it was a it was a, a battle where the U.S. troops were running. They would stop. They would shoot at the Dakota chasing them, get back on the wagon, or try to run and keep up with the wagon. They lost an, a number of uh, soldiers, but who made it back into Hutchinson. But as the war was ending. This is a scene right before the last battle started. And this is out at Wood Lake. So this is south of uh, Granite Falls. So Little Crow's plan was to have all of his soldiers lie down in two rows and hide themselves in the tall grasses. And it was thought that the next morning that Sibley, who was over here somewhere, he was going to just have his long line of troops march toward and march out trying to find them, the Indians. So, but what happened is early that morning, and now, now mind you, we're in September 23rd, 1862, that we are still, that they're running out of food already because of logistics. They're, they're uh, a two hour drive from Fort Snelling, so a lot longer uh, ride in a wagon, a good t uh, two days. So anyway, these men are out on their own, no permission to, to leave camp. They're going to go, they're going to go and uh, dig potatoes. But they almost run over uh, one of the Dakota soldiers here. It starts the battle prematurely. There are soldiers, uh, U.S. Uh, troops over here. They see the battle starts. They come running and the battle begins. It lasts a good two, three hours. Little Crow is, is routed, and they all withdraw. But what happens then is that Little Crow decides 
if I stay, um, we are going to uh, be executed. And so within the next two days, um, probably 3,500, almost 4,000 Dakota, those that are part of uh, the host hostile group or, um, or not. Um, even some of the peace group Dakota left and left into, went into, um, uh, they went into Dakota ter territory or up into Canada. So from the road, you can go down and you can look down over the ravine where the battle was. And from there, you can see the monument that is up there. And so now, what happened that we have an internment camp in this post-war era? Why was the decision made? What route was chosen? Why was the stockade built? You know, these are all questions that I've been asked over the years. Who was confined? Why are there photographs? And which epidemic struck? And what about their activities? There was a decision about why they left, and that was because there were about 13 to 1400 troops. Um, out on the Western Prairie, and there were about 2,000, 1,900, 2,000 Dakota. They had no food. It was, uh, by the time all of the trials were done, it was in October, um, and almost November, into November. Because of the amount of plundering and destruction, there was nothing left out on the prairie. There had been seven or eight years of construction done on both of the uh, agency sites. There were hundreds of homes built. There were, sh um, there were um, sawmills. There was a brick factory. Uh, and so, but al almost everything was gone, except for a few of the buildings at the upper agency. And then there was this, <coughs> fear of Dakota or revenge-minded whites coming out to hurt the Dakota. So here we have just a summation of all this. We have no food, and this is September. So, and then we're going to be adding another 2,000 people to feed. And then everyone wants to eat every day. And so, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Place where all of the captives, the t over 250 mm -hmm. captives were released. And this is another Adrienne Bell image uh, at Camp Release, and this is by present-day Montevideo, and there is a monument there also. But here is one of the buildings. This was the summer kitchen that belonged to one of the uh, fur, fur trade post operators, uh, Francois Labasse, and this is one of the few buildings that was left, and so they had some of the court procedures in here. And this is a picture called New Alm Burning, and if you ever head down to New Alm, uh, I don't know if it's still out there, but it used to be outside uh, a, a gigantic, uh, like a, a, a four by eight uh, piece of plywood with this painting on it. This shows you the destruction that was done to the city. And no one could come down the main street of New Ulm until after 1864. They did not remove the barricades because they were so afraid. They thought, well, what if someone comes back to attack us? We're going to be ready. This is one of the, you know, you wonder why uh, some of the Dakota didn't stay out where their homes were, uh, either on the upper agency or the lower agency. So this is uh, chief, he was a, a, the chief of the Sisseton. So he was at the upper agency, the Yellow Medicine. And so, because he was in the Peace Dakota Party, and they were the ones that rescued and protected the captives. He was able to go, and he and his colleagues, including Peopi, come and go as they pleased. And so he said, General Sibley said, if you want, you can stay. But mind you, we're out on the prairie in November. Everything is destroyed. And so he said, everything is destroyed. What am I going to live on? So he said, what's my option? He had plan B. So he decided he would go to the lower agency and when they would all move down to Fort Snelling, that's what he would do too. 
And again, what, why was the decision to move them? Two reasons, food, security, and safety. And of course, you know, these people didn't want to leave their homes. This, is, this, this was their land now. This was their reserve. But there was no way to keep them safe. And here we, um, here we know, September 23rd, there is no food already for them, for the 13 or 14 soldiers. So they came to Fort Snelling. What route was chosen? Okay. About 1856, all of the towns along the Minnesota River looked up at those two agencies and saw business opportunities. There are 7,000 people up there that want to buy things. They get annuity money every year. So what can we do to make it easy for them? Beginning in 1856, Henderson, St. Peter, their roads went right up to Fort Ridgely. But then there was a road that went to the lower agency from there. Mankato, their uh, road went up to uh, um, the lower agency. And New Ulm had their own, too, also went to the lower agency. But when it was time for them to go to the fort, this wasn't going to be a scenic trip. This is November 7th. They want to get there as quickly as they can. They have a wagon train four miles long. And many of the Dakota owned these wagons. These were their wagons because in January they would sell them and make some money for themselves to put away. But we have to remember that ferries are the way of crossing rivers. So when you have a, a wagon train that's four miles long, you want to cross a river and use a ferry as few times as possible. They used it once. And that was at the old Redwood Ferry. And then they went up the hill to Franklin. So if you've been to Morton, you go up the hill to Franklin. And then it's straight sailing until you get to Henderson. You come down the hill. And then you follow the brand new road that came from the fort. And that was the road that they took. It only took them a couple of days that way. They, they went along the, the river bluffs, or the, uh, the floodplain. And so there were probably a few little streams that they had to cross, little creeks, but not like a river, not like the Mississippi or the Minnesota. And this is the route. The men took their own route. So they're both leaving from by Morton. And so just down the, the, down the street from the lower uh, Sioux Agency is Jackpot Junction. So if you've been there, this, this site here is, is just down the street from there, that, that warehouse. They followed along here until they got to New Ulm. They actually went around New Ulm. They did not go down through uh, Main Street because it was barricaded. And both Sibley, Sibley had decided it would be, not be good to go through close to town as, because um, their town had been burned. They lost probably 60 people at least, besides the 52 just out of town at Milford. But that didn't stop the citizens from New Ulm from running out to meet them. And that is what happened. They stole uh, rocks, uh, pierced them with uh, pitchforks. Uh, one gentleman, uh, Indian soldier, or Indian prisoner was killed. Uh, a German woman uh, hit him in the face with an uh, ax um, and so there were a number of injuries, at least two of these Dakota prisoners uh, on their way to Mankato uh, were killed. But the women and children going to the fort, they, here, here we go across the river, up the hill, to about here is Franklin. Then when you get to Fairfax, Fairfax is the closest to, uh, town to Fort Ridgely, and you just go straight across the flat prairie until you get to Henderson. And then you follow along here. There is no Faxon anymore. Uh, there's a township, and there's a few little buildings that are called, that are in Faxon Township, but there is no town anymore. They followed that all along the floodplain there until they got to Chaska, and then they took the Bloomington, and if you go out to Fort Snelling, 
when you, the historic site, when you exit to go into historic Fort Snelling, you will see Bloomington Road, and that's the last little fragment of that. Yeah. Why was the stockade built, and what did it look like? There were revenge-minded settlers. And so we have a number of the images here. This is by David Geister. Uh, he also did the, uh, uh, the Wood Lake uh, painting, but this uh, painting he did, showing uh, one perspective of it. And this is probably the most famous image. Uh, and this was taken from the top of the bluff by the entrance to Fort Snelling the historic site where those red gates are. And this was probably finished, the, the, uh, the stockade walls was probably finished uh, late December or even early January of 1863. And now it's a little, um, it, there's a question of whether this next photo I'm gonna show you, if this stockade section was inside or outside, and I'll show you what I mean. And this building here, this warehouse building, this is this was used for lots of things. It was the uh, it was the stockade um, hospital. They had church services here, and they also um, taught reading and writing to the Dakota. So I was thinking, I didn't know if this was inside or outside this section here. So and it, I've all, I, I've I've considered that maybe it is, is inside in this particular case. But the Army used one design, one blueprint for its, uh, a lot of its structures. So you had one, you used it everywhere. This particular picture is from the Rock Island Confederate Prisoner of War Camp on Rock Island in Illinois. And this was right across the river from the Davenport prison. And so what they would do in these prisons is that they would put the stockade with little structures here for uh, so they could get out of the cold, and then they would have these steps that go, would go up them, and these would be all around the structure. This I always thought this was a very interesting picture. Though the Fort Snelling one, it is possible that this was inside instead of outside because they didn't have to they only had to see who was coming in, who was confined, and w what were some of the dates. I mean, in, historically, it's a really short period of time that this, this camp was used. The first one that we saw that elderly and the dependents and the Dakota leaders, they were there from November 1862 to May of 1863. There was a second group, and these, um, the military often called these the first family, because almost all of these people were either family members or part of Little Crow's band. So they were his family or in his, uh, in his group. And they had fled out to um, Dakota Territory, um, but when winter came, they weren't able to care for themselves either. And many of the Indians that were out there didn't want them out there because they were afraid the military would think they were supporting these uh, people that had come from Minnesota and they didn't want that. So, so in this group, you will have uh, his son, Wawanape, uh, Little Crow's nephew, one of Little Crow's half-brothers. And then after June and September of 1863, especially in September, the last group left, we had the families of the Dakota Sibley Scouts. So they were originally up by the fort, it was too windy there, wasn't safe. They moved them down to the river flats to where the uh, stack, stockade is that we're familiar with. But on March 19th, there was a letter that went out, March 19th, 1863. Today we have to keep everyone in the stockade because on the 20th, everyone moved up to, remember that first picture we saw of the Fort Snelly sign, up the hill because of this. This is a picture from last week at Fort Snelling. I did not take this. Someone from the, one of the uh, uh, employees down there took it. 
But this is about where the internment camp was. So you can imagine what, the, what it was like March 19th and 20th. They knew the water was coming up from the Minnesota and the Mississippi because this is where the two rivers uh, get together. Uh, and, and here we have some geese that are making themselves at home. So, but this is last week. But this is what happened. So they moved them all up. There is uh, up to the top of the hill. There was never any indication that the stockade was rebuilt around it. And there was no indication that after the waters receded that anyone went back down in the camp. Okay, we have hundreds of photographs that were taken, that have been taken, of the Dakota that were in this camp. And one of the reasons was St. Paul uh, had just uh, probably a dozen different uh, photography studios and galleries. And at this time, we have all these photographers heading out to Fort Snelling so these soldiers could get their picture taken so they could send it to their loved ones before they were deployed to wherever they were going to be sent. But now there was something else. There was one other market, and this was, in fact, Joel Whitney, uh, one of the uh, premier uh, photographers, um, he said he sold thousands of Indian pictures, not just on the East Coast, but he said he had a market in Europe. And so we have all of these uh, various photographers. Upton is the one that took the picture of the stockade. And then having albums was very, it was a popular pastime. So you could buy an album, you know, you could go to one of these galleries, you could get everything you needed. You could get the pages, you could get the little pictures, um, and then you could put it together, you could have, yes, <laughs> just the ones you want, those little cabinet cards. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have, uh, one that is believed to have belonged to John Nicolay, who was, when the Dakota War started, he was on a treaty mission with Bishop Whipple, and uh, they were up by St. Cloud um, Sauk Center, up in that area with the Ojibwe. But he was senior secretary to President Abraham Lincoln. These are some of the pictures. Now, nowadays, we do not use this term anymore. Um, we don't call people vaginas. And it's an uh, Algonquin term. And, you know, people used it for years and had no concept of what they were seeing. And so, but now we know better, so we do better. So, and, and then this is one of the pictures that was probably taken on the top um, wh when they were resettled up at the top of uh, uh, where the sign is at Fort Snelling picture here is also of that group. This is the second group uh, of people who were confined, and this is one of Little Crow's wives. Um, they were apprehended or they surrendered out uh, in the Dakota, uh, Dakota Territory. They were starving, um, and so it was so much easier to surrender to the military. Uh, oftentimes they were first taken to Fort Abercrombie up in the north and then brought down. So, and you know, they have such, these little ones, they have such a distressed look on their face. And these are some more. This is also from the second group. Um, this is one of Little Crow's nephews. This is his son, one of Little Crow's son, always described as being the favorite son from the favorite wife, Wowenape. And this is a picture of one of Little Crow's half-brothers. Um, he, Little Crow's mother was the first wife. She only had Little Crow because uh, the Big Thunder um, took additional wives. And the agreement between the husband and wife was he would not have any more wives. And, and when he did, um, she just separated herself from him. But this is White Spider. And then this is a picture. This was, now here we do see a uh, fence here. Um, so, you know, it is possible that part of the stockade was put up. But this is all of Little Crow's family. And this is a this type of picture is called a stereo view. And so, I mean, it was amazing techno, uh, technological feat because these two pictures are slightly different. 
but it would sit on, or you could place it on this, this uh, little device called a stereo view. And when you looked through the lens, it made it like it was 3D. And so there were theory, a theory of epidemics that hit Minnesota after the 1862 war. And we have to remember that at this time, there is only one vaccine available, and that is for smallpox. And even at this time, it wasn't available to everyone. And so there were cases of smallpox. But these were all of the measles, all of the different uh, epidemics that ra raged through Minnesota and in the internment camp. And when you realize that uh, there were, that these people did not have uh, any kind of a built up immunity um, to any of these diseases. And, and surprisingly, they are almost all respiratory diseases. So people would sneeze or they would cough and that disease would be held in those little droplets uh, and then others would inhale it and then it would spread. And this is what it looks like because most of us have not ever seen measles. Thank goodness. Um, this is a little boy. This is third or fourth day into the epidemic and this is what the uh, slide looks like. Uh, activities. Every day we had a morning report. There was a daily accounting of everybody that was in the internment camp. It was done by their uh, chief or their leader. And it was to uh, make sure that they had the right number of rations because the rations were delivered from the fort. Every day they could leave. They were not forced to stay in. The gates were opened. They could go out. Um, there are... Uh, Pioneer Press news reports that they had come into St. Paul, some of them, to go shopping. They had also go, gone across the river to Mendota. They, go, they were fishing. They were doing their laundry. Um, for the first time, both the prisoners in Mankato and those confined at this internment camp had unlimited access to education. And it is incredible that... Um, the missionaries that were teaching them said they had a mania for learning. And usually when you think learning to read or write as an adult, to me that seemed to be very difficult. But they had, uh, what they had wanted to do was to write their loved ones, either in the prison camp or in the internment camp. And the missionaries would take the letters back and forth. And then we have what is the first accounting of uh, the Dakota War, and this is, oops, I think I did something here. The Congressional Globe was what we now call the Congressional Record, mm -hmm. and it, this was a letter that was written by all of these men here, these leaders of the Dakota people, and they wrote this letter to President Lincoln, mm -hmm. and they wanted to explain to him what had happened. They have said, we know that our young men did wrong. We know that we will end up paying for this. Um, we are very sorry for their actions that we could not control them. So, but it, it's, uh, and, and they had no idea of what was going to happen to them after that. This is one of the daily rosters. And here it has a listing, a listing of each one of the chiefs and how many they, people they had in each band. And here's Teope, here's his. And there is Wabisha, uh, Red Legs. Uh, so, and, there, and then also the mixed bloods. You know, this is another term that we, we would say mixed bloods now. Not half breeds, but that was the term of the day. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Black dog. black dog, yes. Okay, black dog rode along the river in Burnsville, and I was wondering, oh, why was it named that? Did somebody see a black dog there? Right. <laughs> in, 
So next time that you're going down Highway 13 and you look over to the river and you see that tall um, uh, Excel exhaust pipe or, or mm -hmm. smoke pipe, that is where Black Dog's original village was. Mm -hmm. So And so, and then after 1851, after the treaty, then they moved out to the Western Prairie. So, but this is uh, what, uh, every day, one of these was written. And then you, the people that were inside the internment camp, they could exit, and they could come and go as they pleased, except at night they had to be inside because the stockade door needed to be locked. If you wanted to go into the camp, you could easily get uh, a pass. And here we have Bishop Whipple's pass. Uh, he paid a few visits, uh, but this one was from April 29th, 1863, because on that day, he performed a confirmation uh, for a number of the Dakota uh, that had become members of uh, the church. And so here are some of the people that helped uh, develop the Dakota language from just sound to written. And we, uh, we talked earlier about the Dakota Friend. This was a newspaper that Gideon Pond uh, printed and published. It did not last long because it was too expensive and they did not have enough readership. But half of it was in Dakota and half of it was in English. So those people learning to read and write could l look at this newspaper. And this is a picture from Jeff and Candy Williamson's. They are descendants from uh, all of these missionaries. Um, this is Samuel, this is Gideon Pond, and then this was the very first house that they lived at out at Old Bay Calhoun. Um, they came in 1835. They started collecting um, words and letters and writing the alphabet. Um, what they had wanted to do as teenage boys, they were like 17 and 19, this was like during the great religious revival in the East, and they lived in Connecticut. They were going to devote their lives to spreading the gospel. I mean, they, they were high school, you know, age, but this is what they had decided to do. They spent their entire life doing this. In Bloomington, this is a place that is really great to visit. This is the Gideon Pond House, federal style, I believe it is, but he and his uh, workman and his sons um, they made 40,000 bricks for this house. And it is so, it is so uh, unusual because it, you have an exterior wall that you see, but then there's about 12 inches of airspace and there's the interior brick wall. And it, um, I've been in the house at night for meetings when it's like zero. And I don't think it's ever been below 50 in there. So it's, it's, it's incredible, the, the technology that they knew, the skills that they had. And here we have uh, Reverend Dr. Williamson. This picture was taken uh, early morning, August 17, 1862, at the Williamson uh, Mission. And this is Reverend Williamson here, Dr. Reverend. I mean, he, he had his medical training at Yale, so I mean, they had just expert care. And this is his wife, Margaret, and this is his sister, Sarah, Sarah Jane. And this is another one of uh, Ebel's pictures, one of the stereo views. And Ebel and his assistant came out from, uh, from well, he was a, st a student also at Yale. <coughs> Bless you. And uh, um, he, they wanted to see Indians. That was, they were so excited, and, and they did. And so this is another one of those Arthur and Maggie Adams photos. This is from between 1910 and 1929. This is what was left of the Williamson house. This is their basement. Here's their home. And now, um, you know, it's probably all filled in. And then what happened is um, at, the, at the fort in the internment camp, um, the, the, the chief of the um, 
of the Sisseton went across the river to visit with Henry Sibley, and he said, how about if we volunteer as your scouts on the Western Prairie? We will help protect it, and we know, we know um, the land. And so 1863, they went out in slaves, and they were dropped off at Rice Creek. And here we have a picture of uh, April 29, 1863, and here is Bishop Whipple, and this is during the confirmation uh, class for um, they had first been uh, uh, instructed and then baptized, and then they were confirmed, and Bishop uh, completed the service for them. Terminate, uh, temporary homes. Henry Sibley provided housing for about 30 Dakota. So not everyone went uh, out to Crow Creek, but you also know that here that Alexander Faribault uh, took 90 under his wing. He was guardian for 90 people. Um, they stayed in their teepees on his farm. And so here we have uh, Henry Sibley, and here we have uh, a long highway. Uh, well, now it's called 62, but it used to be 110. And this is in right over here by the lake is where those Dakota stayed with Sibley. And it was, here we have a picture of Faribault. And so they were all in front on his property, on his farm. And it eventually caused him to go bankrupt. So, and here we have the final, uh, second final slide of the, um, we have the group of, of Dakota prisoners that went to Davenport, to Camp McClellan, and then there was a second camp there, uh, Kearney. The women and children, unfortunately, went to a hellhole, uh, Crow Creek Reservation, where they suffered. And so, they're, they're you know, to describe the, the terribleness of this, these three years um, is just, you know, it's beyond words. They're, they suffered so. Um, in 1866, a new reservation was established for them at Santee. It was already being settled by, uh, you know, Americans, by white settlers. And the U.S. government told them, plant everything, because when we bring them down from Crow Creek, uh, we want everything ready for them. They just move in. And so they did move a couple of other places around this area after that, but this was their new homeland and the beginning of a better future. And here is the Jean-Baptiste Faribault House in Faribault. It's uh, in very good condition. So if you visit the Sibley House uh, down in Mendota, please stop and... and uh, and uh, tour the homes, they're usually, um, everything is usually open after Memorial Day. So, thank you so much for your fine attendance, and uh, I, I really appreciate being able to be here with you tonight to, to share uh, this, this hard story within our history. But to know that um, there would be success for the bands of Dakota. Um, we only have to look at the, uh, not, you know, not even looking at the Ojibwe, but we have the Mystic Lake, we have the Prairie Island Band, we have the Morton Band, and we have the Upper uh, Agency, or Yellow Medicine Band. Uh, and all of those groups, uh, a small number in what they had been, because we have Dakota, from Minnesota to Manitoba, out to Nebraska, and into South Dakota. And so there is success in that they survived and are now uh, succeeding. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah.